Hello and welcome to Bites of History with Irene Walton. I'm your host, Irene Walton. My hair's darker. I don't know if you noticed, but it is. Dark chocolate, as it were. Could we be talking about another chocolate magnate of the 1900s? We most certainly are. I told you guys last week already, so I don't think it's very surprising. But today we are talking about the history of the Mars Company, Franklin Mars and his son, Forrest Mars. Let's dive in. Have you ever wondered how it made it to your table? Have you ever wondered how it made it to your shelf? If you love food, show for you bites of history with Irene. of course i want to thank all of my patrons thank you guys so much for joining the patreon every time i see a new member it makes me so so happy we have a really good time on there we talk about the podcast we also talk about like the bachelor and the bachelorette and what's going on there i mean i don't know if you guys saw that finale but so it means a lot you guys can join the patreon for only two dollars you can become a little producer for just two dollars a month and it helps me out a lot So thank you for that. And another big thank you to Anya Bechtel, I believe is how you pronounce your name. She sent me some cash on the old Venmo, which uh, is like what I use to buy my little coffee when I go write my little podcast scripts. So thank you very much for that. And oh my gosh, let's say thank you to our sources as well. If we're getting all these thank yous out of the way, I'll tell you what. Of course, I uh, referenced the Food That Built America podcast. I love them so much. I also used wikipedia.org, mars.com, lemelson.mit.edu, todayifoundout.com, snackhistory.com, and the New York Times.com. Let's begin. It is September 24th, 1983, when Franklin Clarence Mars is born. He's born in Glenwood, Minnesota, and is commonly referred to as Frank C. Mars. So you'll probably hear me call him Frank or Franklin, depending on the vibe. Now, Frank was a really sickly kid. He actually got struck with a mild case of polio when he was a child. So he was definitely not like the other boys his age. He was inside a lot didn't go out much, didn't get to play outside very often. But what he did love to do was watch his mom, Alva, make chocolates and make cakes and make little pastries and make confections in the kitchen. So he loved doing that, kind of because it was the only thing he got to do, but also because he really just had an affinity for it. She taught him how to hand dip chocolate at a very young age. So that's what he did for a long time. And at 19 years old, he starts selling molasses chips, which if you've ever had them from Seas Candy, wow, your life is just a little bit better, isn't it? And if you haven't, they're like a butter, butter scotchy kind of like buttercream candy covered in chocolate. In 1902, at 19 years old, he marries Ethel Kissack, who is a school teacher, and they are married in Minneapolis, Minnesota. A couple, uh, and during this time, he actually acquires a wholesale candy business selling candy to smaller businesses. In 1904, they have their son, Forrest, who's going to be a very big part of this story. So keep that in mind. Oh, in last week's episode, I accidentally called Franklin, or I accidentally called Forrest Franklin. So, so if you're watching the YouTube video, I corrected that on the screen, but if you didn't see that, I don't, I'm sure you weren't that upset about it, but I messed it up. So my apologies there. But pretty shortly after that, the wholesale candy company goes under and Franklin has a failed business under his belt and Ethel is getting pretty pissed. He is trying anything. He's trying work in the candy business, which we know he loves so much. He's trying, he's a chip salesman for a while. He's doing whatever he can to help keep his family afloat. And it's just not working out. Ethel's not impressed. She's actually so unimpressed that she divorces him in the mid 1500s, like 1500, uh, I'm sorry, in the mid 1900s, 1905 ish around there. She also gets complete custody of their son, Forrest. However, she is not really in the picture anymore. And we find out that Forrest is sent to go live in Saskatchewan, Canada with Ethel's parents. So his grandparents, Franklin and Forrest have no contact for a while, which I'm sure is very upsetting for both of them for different reasons. So that sucks. But <laughs> but during this time of Forrest being in Canada with uh, his grandparents, Franklin decides he's going to try his luck in Tacoma, Washington, starting a new candy business there. In 1910, he meets another woman named Ethel and marries her, and they have daughter Patricia in 1911. 1911 is the same year that he starts the Mars Candy Factory in Tacoma, Washington, but that candy factory fails as well, unfortunately, because there's an already established candy market 
in Tacoma called Brown and Haley. And so they kind of have their the their thumb on the pulse of the candy confection world of Washington. Now, this is also the time where Hershey is absolutely demolishing. I don't know if you guys remember from last week, but in 1910, Hershey has the best selling candy bar in the United States. His Hershey bar is a nickel. Hershey's kisses have come out already. He's doing great. And Mars is so frustrated because he just like doesn't know this like secret sauce he's missing. So in 1920, with $400 to his name, Mars moves his new Ethel and (laughs) new daughter, Patricia, back to Minneapolis, Minnesota. Now, this is where he comes out with the Mar-O bar, M-A-R-O bar, and it actually does pretty well. It picks up some steam and he's kind of living. He's stoked. The success of this bar allows him to buy a house and kind of keep his company going, support his family, and he's just so happy that this has finally worked out. Now, while this was happening for Franklin, Forrest was in school. He actually went to the University of California in Berkeley, which if you guys don't live in California or you're not from the States, is a very like prestigious school to go to. From Berkeley, he actually transfers to Yale, uh, which is an even more prestigious school to go to. Neither of these I've ever even been near, if you were wondering. <laughs> I'm not more, I'm not really a prestigious school kind of gal. I'm more of a state school, get in, get out, get your degree, you're done kind of gal. But Forrest wasn't, and that shows up a lot in his work ethic. He's very much a Yale boy, if there's one thing I know for sure. He was studying industrial engineering, whatever that means, and he did great. He became a traveling salesman, and he was spending a lot of his time in Chicago working for the Camel brand cigarette company. Forrest was quite the salesman. So much so that one day when he was plastering up camel cigarette ads, he went a little overboard and plastered up too many and got arrested. So he's in jail in Chicago, and the only person who can bail him out is his dad, who he has not spoken to in a very long time. So his dad comes all the way from Minneapolis to Chicago, bails his son out, and the famous story is that they then go to a soda fountain, which are really, really popular in these days in the 20s. Frank and his son, Forrest, are sitting there sharing a milkshake. And Forrest says something to the effect of like, hey, it'd be sick as hell if you could put this flavor of like the malted milkshake into a candy bar. And his dad was like, that's the fucking tea, bitch. I absolutely will do that. <laughs> that's, the, that's the literal quotes that happened from that from that day. <laughs> So basically, but that did actually happen. That's how we get the ultra famous candy bar that we know as the Milky Way. And that is hugely successful. I will tell you what. (laughs) So these Milky Ways were made with what was called Minneapolis nougat. Uh, And I just say this because I thought it was so interesting. Traditional Italian nougat has been around since like the 15th century, combining egg whites and honey. Minneapolis nougat was created with egg whites and a sugary like syrup instead of honey. So they were using that and the caramel and the chocolate and it was going crazy. It was blowing up. This candy bar helps the company grow to $800,000 a year, which is absolutely wild. Frank and Forrest decide to move the company to Chicago because there's a much better railway system there. So transportation is a lot easier and a lot cheaper. And by 1928, they are making $20 million in revenue a year. In today's money, that is $275 million every year. 200 employees ended up moving to Chicago with them. And they actually purchase a few local farms in the area. I would imagine to sort of like go off the Hershey vibe of being able to like have their own fresh milk imported, fresh eggs, things like that. But also because... Frank Mars loves horses. Now, my favorite little fact is that we get the name Snickers because Frank Mars loved horses so much that he named one of the most famous candy bars in the world after his favorite horse, Snickers. Now, it was around this time that Mars and Hershey became serious business partners because we are now in the 1930s. The Depression is here. The World War, the World War Two. Well, I guess World War Two is happening, um, and sugar rationing is about to start taking place. So Mars knows that Hershey's the only one who's in control of that. 
So Mars actually becomes one of Hershey's best customers. Mars being the company, Forrest and Franklin. Mars actually becomes Hershey's best customer, uh, having a contract at about $7.5 million a year for the chocolate candy coating from Hershey's that would go on to Mars candy bars. Now, like we talked about in the last episode, Hershey wasn't too nervous about this because Mars made it pretty clear that he liked his regional candy bar success. He had no real interest in like expanding like crazy, but he was just so happy that after all these failed attempts at working in candy, he was doing really well. So he was just content with what was going on. And Hershey was content that he was too. (laughs) However, Frank and his son Forrest had very different ideas of what the Mars company could be. Frank was happy keeping it small and regional and just being super successful in that realm. But Forrest was like, yo, we could make this so much bigger. Like, why don't you want this to expand? And so after badgering his dad about it, Franklin gives Forrest $50,000 and says, fine, go to Europe, go across the old pond. And sorry for that. Um, Go to Europe, go to the UK, see what you can do with this. So Forrest says, okay, great. Thank you so much. See you later. In 1932, Forrest moves to the UK and starts expanding in a lot of different ways. He starts making connections and setting up businesses that weren't even on the radar in the United States. But unfortunately, in 1934, his dad, Franklin, very suddenly passes away on the factory floor of the Mars Candy Company in Chicago. And what really breaks my heart is... um, Forrest wasn't able to get back in town for his dad's funeral. And it's just so sad, especially because him and his dad built this amazing thing together. I just, I, I mean, you guys know that's my, I sympathize greatly, but this most certainly did not stop Forrest. If anything, it pushed him even harder to make this business work and not prove his dad wrong. But I think in my heart, I believe he just wanted to make his dad proud of like, look, you told me to go across and make shit happen. And I did like I did it. And I think that's pretty magical. And he did a lot of stuff, dude. He was the first person who was like, oh, we should make food specifically for dogs. Like we should be making dog food. So he started uh, the Chappy Dog Food Company in the UK. I don't know if that's still a thing out there, but That was like the dog food brand. And that was in 1935. Now, I know we talked about this in the last episode as well, uh, but I kind of messed up the Eminem story. Everything about him seeing it in the Spanish Civil War, that was all correct. It was just the fact um, when he went to William Murray and talked to him about getting the chocolate for the the candy-coated chocolates, Eminem's, William Murray was like, yes, 20% for the chocolate, uh for us to have a 20% share, but also my son is going to be your partner in this M&M contract. So like that was the thing that uh, was about his son. So my apologies for getting that incorrect last time. But in 1950, Forrest actually ends up buying out Bruce Murray, the son of William, who was the president of Hershey from the M&M's contract. And in 1956, M&M's are the biggest, best-selling, most popular candy in the United States. That is crazy town. Oh, and in 1954, peanut M&Ms get introduced, which are one of my personal favorites too. Mars actually became involved in the vending machine business and in in the realm of his pet food creations. He also started a brand of cat food. That's where Whiskas comes from. And it's, it's crazy. Like his work ethic was insane. He was known for having a really intense work ethic and like just being very, very strict on like, if you're doing well, you'll get rewarded. If you're not doing well, you'll get, um, there will be penalties for not doing well. So it was just, it was very early American mindset of like, never stop working, work so hard, work yourself into the ground. And I mean, it didn't not work for him. I'll tell you what, like, Mars was at one point for quite some time the largest privately held company in the United States of America, period, end of story. And it's still number four on the, like, it's the fourth largest privately held company still in America. They keep stuff very in the family. It's still a family owned company. They keep stuff pretty to themselves. It's obviously worked out. Quality has always been super, super, super important to them. I think part of the reason it was so important for Forrest to have the quality be so impeccable was to kind of like keep his dad's name and legacy 
you know, right up at the top where it should be. He was, I think he was just really proud of it, which is amazing. In 1973, he technically retired, but uh, Forrest still worked on stuff and was very involved in, in the production of things and the quality checking of things. He also started a candy company when he was retired called Ethel M. Chocolates, named after his mom, uh, that eventually got bought by the Mars Company in 1988. And in July of 1999, Forrest Mars passes away at the age of 95. And that's the the quick and dirty history of Mars. Obviously, a lot happens in between, you know, the Milky Way and global expansion. But I just I wanted to share that because I thought it was so cool to have Mars and Hershey right next to each other. So I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode of Bites of History. I can't wait to dive in to next week's episode of Bites of History because we are going to be talking about the food of Alcatraz. Spooky. Please make sure that you like, comment, and turn on the notification bell. Subscribe as well. Check out my Patreon. It means a lot to me. Even if you just snoop around, see what you like, see what maybe you want to be a part of. It means a lot and I would love to have you in there. So thank you guys so much. I hope you have a great week and I will see you on Friday. We have Friday videos too. Okay, goodbye. Bye.